Well, hello guys. Welcome back to uh new DM. Um this is the uh Nexus of Geek channel and I'm coming to you uh with yet another uh Dungeons and Dragons video and uh I try to get these more of these out on a frequent basis. And um the last time I was um doing a compare and contrast, sort of comparing the fourth uh edition Dungeons and Dragons um player's handbook with the uh, fifth edition uh, PHB. And I just looked at the first couple of chapters for each uh, volume for each book. And um, with the interest of um, uh, putting together a, a further in-depth look. Um, yeah, uh, uh, these days, I'm, I, and I, I, I said in the last video that I am not one of these people that are uh, very critical of um, the fourth edition version of the game. I know people, there's some people that have some kind of weird hang up or aversion um, to uh, even discussing fourth edition. But I, I, I think that the system and the game itself, although it was radically, radically different, I will admit, anybody will tell you that from what went before that, um, so was third edition. Like when you think about it, I don't remember the transition between second edition and uh, third edition in the year 2000 or so that much be even before 3.5 became um, super mega popular and that's because i wasn't really playing the game i uh, i had kind of uh put it down for a while i was busy with college life real life things so i dabbled with first edition and then in high school and then uh, by the time second edition came out excuse me second edition came out i wasn't really playing uh fairly regularly although even though i still wanted to but i just didn't have the the t the time or the um uh yeah mostly the uh, focus and time doing other things but be that as it may that's neither here nor there i have rediscovered the game and i have been playing a lot of fifth edition with uh multiple groups this year and it's made me really happy to reconnect and to play a streamlined version of my favorite rpg uh tabletop rpg and uh i am going to continue the series of um looking at both systems for a while, at least the core books, and I thought uh, really get into in depth in that uh, at the end of this year and to the next because next year we we do have the fiftieth anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons, and I know Wizards of the Coast is making all these hoopla again and they're redesigning stuff again, and they've had um, this uh, play test for the new uh, system, so they're gonna come out with yet another version of the player's handbook and the uh, monster manual and uh, the uh, Dungeons, uh, Dungeon Masters um, Guide. So the three core books in essence and what uh, there's a, a recent video and I, uh, I'm i going to link to it on the description to this video where uh, uh, Perkins and the powers that be over at uh, the uh, Dungeons and Dragons studio is what they're calling the, themselves now but it's basically Wizard, the Wizards of the Coast uh, uh, developers, game developers and where they talk about how um, they're new uh, set of rule books is going to be backwards compatible with with 5e uh, which remains to be seen how backwards compatible cap compatible it really is but basically if you look at that video to summarize it really quick and not really to diverge too or to uh, digress too much um they just basically said that if you have your 5e books uh you're still going to be able to use them because this is not really a new system they're just adding they added um elements to the game over the whole uh 10 year decade long span from 2014 which when 5b came out to the present or to i guess when whenever these books come out in early 2024 and you'll be able to use them um and they're just are going to be more um geared towards new people uh, teaching people how to dm how do a better presentation new art and different elements so i don't know i'm intrigued by it and uh but i'm not gonna rush out i say that i'm gonna rush out and get the products um but uh, the purpose of today, and with the long preface out of the way, I'm sorry to uh, to uh, go off the rails a little bit there. But the plan is to look at um, continue looking at the fourth edition and five edition core manuals, and uh, because I have it in my head that I kind of want to do sort of a fourth edition game with with five e rules. For example, I like to really run a campaign using the four e. Um, powers and mechanics, not all of them, uh, just, you know, uh, a good portion of them, the ones that, that work best or that I like best. 
uh, and I understand best and add some fifth edition mechanics that we know work really well, like the advantage and disadvantage. People are familiar with those and um, and then just sort of mesh them together um, and make this this one cool game. So I, I, I'm still kind of dreaming about that, but that's sort of uh, the purpose of this um, this uh, whole series, really, of series that I'm going to be, uh, of videos that I'm going to be making. And um, I'm really going to, uh, I've, I've tempted in the past to make these comparisons, and I've kind of fallen short, just kind of just skimmed it here and there. But um, we're going to start with the races, in um, and the first race that appears in the fourth edition um, a book, Player's Handbook is the Dragonborn, so we'll take a look at the Dragonborn. Uh, we'll take a look at both 4E and 5E race and uh, mechanics, um, or what the races look like in both in both systems, and then also talk a little bit about lore with different settings because I like lore and I think lore adds a whole lot to your uh, role playing, obviously, and um, and every setting treats the Dragonborn a little differently, um, at least uh, the ones I'm familiar with. Uh, recently got a hold of Matt Mercer's first uh, Exandria uh, campaign, uh, ra rather setting book uh, with with the content of Tolderai, and I did run a run a one shot in Tolderai. Oh, Tolderai! I don't know how to say. It. I think it's Tolderai, but I ran a one shot for my group, and they really liked it. You know, it was in the Verdant Expanse, and I'm not a big critical role fan. I I can't. I, I just realized that I can't sit through like two hours of a like, uh, D and D. Uh, uh, play thing like on the internet. I'd rather play the game than watch it. Watch other people having fun and playing it. But if that's your thing, you know, more power to you. But I do like the world setting that Matt Mercer has incorporated. Hey, that guy's a genius in terms of like DMing, in my opinion, and in terms of uh, world building. And I, I get a lot from uh, his uh, his books and his um, uh, milieu, French or universe, whatever, you know, uh, Xandra, uh, Wild Mount, those type of things. And you, if, you, if you're if you a TR fan, or a critter, as they call themselves, if you're a critter, you, you're pretty familiar with those settings. So the Dragonborn has a specific um, way that they uh, conduct themselves. Probably one of the most famous Dragonborns in recent media um, was the Critical Role uh, Dragonborn from Draconia, which was... Um, in the uh, first campaign and then you know they have that whole i don't know what happened their conflicts and you know um i guess uh the role player kind of broke away from from uh critical role he was no longer in the cartoon or in the second of uh, subsequent seasons um or campaigns as they call it campaign two he wasn't a, the the character wasn't a part of it but anyway that's all a roundabout way of me saying that the dragonborn functioned differently in terms of lore in different settings, and we'll take a look at that um, in subsequent videos as well. So today, uh, uh, without further, uh, uh, without as they say, without further ado, let's go ahead and delve into um, how the Dragonborn um, is uh, presented in the fourth edition uh, PHB, and then we'll look at five E, and then we'll look at some lore, and then move on to the other um, the other races. So I I changed my mind. At first, I was going to talk about the mechanics for uh, on the PHB for 4E to start with, but I think I'm gonna instead pivot here and um, talk about uh, lore uh, because um, I don't know. I'm just like not in the head headspace to um, to talk about um, bonuses and numbers. I'd rather talk about lore first. So we'll do that and. Um, yeah, as I said, the Dragonborn, if you're not familiar with the Dragonborn, I mean, if you play Dungeons and Dragons, you probably are, but the, just on the rare chance that there's some people that don't know um, what they're all about, um, I don't know if the Dragonborn were around, uh, like, when they really started as a playable, I mean, they started as a playable race in 4th edition, I'm pretty sure, because I looked at the player's handbook for 3.5 and they weren't they weren't uh, a play world race there there all unless they became part of it um with another supplement because i know that there were um so many splat uh what do you call it yeah the splat books and the supplement 3.5 which is they just went crazy with like the different books so unless it's in it, it, the race uh the is a playable race is in another book um at least 
And since I'm restricting these videos to the core books anyway, um, the first time that you could uh, pick up a uh, core book like the player's handbook um, and you could play a, a Dragonborn, as far as I know, was um, in the fourth edition. Um, and so um, if I'm wrong, please somebody correct me in the comments or, you know, let me know. But I believe that's the timeline. So, um, uh, but they are... And uh, I don't know um, if they were a, a, a big part of the um, Store Coast, the Faerun, the Forgotten Realms. Uh, 5e started off back in 2014, um, and they had an, uh, the very first setting, and uh, the default setting for fourth edition, uh, for fifth edition rather, uh, was a um, was the Forgotten Realms. And um, as you can see in the background, um, I. Uh, I'm going to reference the Store Coast Adventures Guide, uh, which is a very underrated supplement. It doesn't; it gets a bad rap. There's a lot of people that throw a lot of shade at it. I don't know why. I mean, I find that to be a very uh, a good source book. Uh, um, I know it's one of the early ones, and maybe that's why people don't really like it because they think that um, the the presentation is not as good as later um, supplements. But I like it, and I think that. Um, I, I use it a lot. I refer to. I had a couple of campaigns that I was running in the Sword Coast because, of course, I was. I, I took material from um, the uh, starters, the starter set, the 2014 starter set. So Lost Mine, Lost Mines to Fandelber. Everybody's. Uh, that's one of a lot of people's um, very first 5e adventures that they tried, and uh, I did too. And uh, they were there were not a lot of Dragonborn running around. The Forgotten Realms in that adventure. So I don't know if um, if they uh, brought them back or they introduced them later. Um, but the, they are referenced. Um, there is some lore about the Dragonborn in the Sword Coast Adventure, which uh, guide Sword Coast Adventures guide, which dates back to 2015, just a year after the introduction of um, Fifth Edition. And if you go to that uh, volume on page 112. The dragonborn uh, born are, are are described and mentioned, and it talks about how they're uh, humanoids from another world. The dragonborn of Faerun are a proud, honorable, and uh, relatively uh, an honorable and uh, relatively rare, a rare race. So you, so it does say that you can't. They're not like really. There's not a lot of dragonborn running around in the uh, Sword Coast. Slaves to dragons on their world of, on their on their world of origin, uh, and it doesn't say what the the world of origin is. So I assume that um, wherever they came from, you know, they were they were slaves to dragons. They are now a free people looking for a place and purpose to their new world. So they're not from this world or from the 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 world wherever the Forgotten Realms is set in, and so they are. From the prime material plane, but doesn't I think it's funny that it doesn't specify um, what world there are. So I don't know if that's open ended because it, they leave it up to the DM and the players to figure out uh, or to make that up themselves. So it's open ended that way, or um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe um, I haven't read enough uh, novels, D and D novels by Salvatore, uh, who uh, was. Um, Really, pretty much the primary author back in the day, TSR days, and into the '90s, um, that was writing uh, uh, D and D lore novels. So I don't know the Dragonborn. I don't know where they come from. Uh, it doesn't say in this book. So if somebody knows, maybe you can tell me. But on certain origins, actually, it goes on to talk about origins. So maybe uh, this description will give me a little more clues on on that. It says, as with all stories of the ancient past. Tales of the origins of the Dragonborn are hazy and sometimes contradictory. Each each reveals something about the Dragonborn in its telling, however. Okay, so it's supposed to be mysterious, I guess. Um, one story, for example, relates that the Dragonborn were shaped by the ancient uh, Dragon God. Um, uh, let's take a close look at that. Uh, by the ancient dragon god Eo, Io, I think it's Eo, um, at the same time that Eo created the dragons. Um, in the beginning of days, 
EO-infused brilliant astral spirits with the unchecked fury of the elements. The greater spirits became dragons, creatures so powerful, proud, and willful that they were lords of the newborn world. Although smaller in stature, they were no less dra draconic in nature. This tale stresses the close kinship between dragons and dragonborn. While reinforcing the natural order of things, dragons rule and dragonborn serve, at least according to the dragon for, 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 for former masters. And I should say at this point that I know that the Fistbang books, uh, Fistbang Treasury of Dragons, which I'll, I'll probably, uh, we can take a look at you know, at some later uh, period, does have if more, even more information on the dragon war because it's a book about dragons, obviously. And it goes into very uh, great detail of the different type of dragonborn that there are. And the dragonborn variety presented in that book are kind of canon to D&D now. And there, there's a lot of them. There's like, and different colors and like different, um, depending on their uh, origin or their backgrounds, rather. They all have different powers. And some of them are more, more uh, prominent than others. Um so the uh, uh, I guess it, the, so the this book the Sorcor Sor Adventures Adventurer's Guide goes over um, a, a couple of a possible origins. So it keeps talking about the. the I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically I'm just going to give you the highlights. And it talks about um, the different um, origins of the Dragon War. Uh, despite their different conclusions, it says a common theme binds all the legends together. The Dragonborn owe their existence to Io, the, or Io, I don't know, <laughs> again, I, I think it's Io. Io, the great uh, dragon god who created all of dragon kind. Uh, the Dragonborn, all legends agree, are not the creations of uh, Bahamut or Tiamat. As you know, the D&D the, the lore, Bahamut and Tiamat are opposition. They're like night and day, right? you know. Light in the dark, uh, evil dragon versus uh, good dragon. Uh, so, but he says that all legends um, are not. Uh, they tells that the the dragonborn are not the create the creations of Bahamut or Tiamat, and so they have no predetermined side on, in the conflict between these two gods. So, they don't they don't have a pony in the good good versus bad um, uh, ongoing struggle. Every individual dragonborn, regardless of one's particular dracon draconic ancestry, makes a personal choice in matters of ethics and morality. So they're independents, uh, for the most part. Uh, and then he talks about the fight for freedom. They want to get their freedom from whatever oppressing, oppressing, uh, oppressing, oppressing forces they face. Uh, they're all about honor and family. And this part is interesting, their philosophy on religion. Their, their code of honorable behavior and unswearing loyalty serves the dragonborn as a kind of faith. And according to the traditionalists among them, the outlook is all that is all that the religion they need. Um, because they were forced to worship their draconic masters in times of in the past, dragonborn are generally skeptical about religion, seeing a, as a form of servitude. That's interesting. So they were slave. They were forced to be slaves two dragons against their will and so some of them uh rebel against that currently um they are um they are uh skeptical you know and uh uh eo brought them into being that ancient deity is either long dead or on un uncaring about their fate okay so they're skeptical they believe that they, 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 they believe no matter how their orig original god eo brought them in into the world that that deity is no longer here and so um the dragon gods that supplanted eo seem primarily interested in amassing soldiers for the for the conflict you know so this is you can tell the rich elements that they that we and that's why i really like this book because it's full of all this kind of stuff and it talks about you can tell that when they were creating the the lore for the dragon boar race for uh specifically for the Sword Coast, because I, as I said, it's different depending on the setting that you play in. Um, they were really thinking about this conflict, you know, how they were former slaves and uh, they were forced to be, uh, have adopt a philosophy or, or, or a religion in the past, but now they're rebelling against it. They don't necessarily 
feel as though they um they need to adhere to that anymore so that but there's always like you know that tension and that conflict in their legacy in their um heritage which is i think is really rich and uh really adds a lot to when it, when you play this if you choose to play this race still some dragonborn do hear the call of the gods of Faerun and choose to serve them and are loyal uh, in th this faith as they are to any other cause. Uh, Bahamut and Tiamat have dragonborn worshippers. No, Bahamut and Tiamat have dragonborn worshippers and, and both um, Torn and Tyr. Torm and Tyr appear to the dragonborn born sense of honor and order. Similarly, uh, Tempest and the Red Knight ap appeal to the warrior spirit in some dragonborn, and Kellenvor speaks to some of the inability of death and the need to live well in one's allotted time. So he talks about what uh, deities or uh, what uh, higher force appeals to each dragonborn in terms of their religion. And there is a whole section at the beginning of this source book that talks about the different, um, different deities. At, uh, at the store coast and that it, it, it brings it it's a whole section at the beginning of the book starting on page um what page is that at? that is on page uh 21 and the specific inf information on the dragonborn um the dragonborn Deities, it's not really like spelled out. I mean, they have the other races where they do spell them out. Looking through the book now, so pardon my flipping back and forth, but um, I see the 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 Phyrenium Pantheon, which is on page twenty one of the Sword Coast Guide, and then there's the um, the Dwarven Pantheon, the Elven, the Drow, and the Halfling, and the Gods, uh, the Gnomish, and the Orc. Pantheon doesn't really give you a whole lot, um, hardly anything on the, the dragonborn um, gods. But anyway, um, oh here it is, uh, Tempus. Uh, they did mention they did mention Tempus and Thorm and Ty Timora um, and Tyr. So I I we read about Tempus is the full hammer lord of the battles. So that would make sense because the you know um, there's some dragonborn that were uh, because of their size and their power they would be attracted to battle and then Torm is the loyal fury the true the hand of righteousness Torm is the god of duty and loyalty re revered by those who face danger to bring about a greater good uh, a greater good and then Tyr is um, uh, the maiden god and Grimjaws, the mating god, and the even-handed. Uh, Tyr Grimjaws, Tyr the even-handed, wounded Tyr, the main the main god, and the blind, blind Tyr, the lord of justice. All of those names speak to the nature of the Far, Far, Farunian god of justice. Okay, so Tyr is the god of justice, and it has a, a bunch of names. And so all of those are mentioned as possible deities. I guess what I'm gathering from this section is that the dragonborn don't necessarily have an ascribe a, or a prescribed or, de or a designated uh, deity such as the elves. Um, at least in the Forgotten Realms lore, they don't have a specific god that, that, that they um, that they answer to, which is pretty interesting, you know. So I didn't mean this to convert into like a um, into a uh, affirmation or a uh, sort of. Uh, in support, I don't know what the right word is, but I, um, you know, I guess advocacy. I'm not really advocating at, for the uh, Sword, Sword, Sword Coast Adventures Guide, although I do think that Sword Coast Adventures Guide, like I said, gets a bad rap, and I think it's a re it's a good resource, you know, for what it is. It gives you uh, uh, good information on. I think part of it is that it it just kind of gives you like a the tip of the iceberg. It doesn't really give you like a very meaty, in depth look at things. And I think people don't like that. But I think if you're new and you don't know anything about the Forgotten Realms, of which the Dragonborn race we just saw is a part of, even though they're rare compared to like elves or other races, if you don't know, 
then uh, it might be it, uh, it, it might be a good reference tool. I just have it handy, and you know, and then when something you know, I'm playing a campaign in the Forgotten Realms, and I really don't know, I don't know what deity a cleric would be loyal to. Then I just pick it up, and I, I I find it to be a good reference. But anyway, that is um a little bit of lore on the Dragonborn. I don't want to make this too long, but I think the next video will finish off the lore. Um, in other settings, like maybe take a look at Exandrian uh, Dragonborn and take a look at um, then the mechanics finally between the 4E Dragonborn and the 5E Dragonborn. I don't know if they're going to be a race. I'm pretty sure that they're going to be a race available in the new player's handbook, but uh, but I haven't seen the, haven't really followed the uh, uh, Unearthed Arcana, the UAs or the playtests really that closely anymore. I did in the beginning, but kind of lost interest. So I think I'm just going to wait until the new book comes out and then flip through it and see if they're part of it. But as I think they'll be part of it, but I'm not 100% sure. But that's the uh, the a little bit of lore on the dragon board. And then as I say, the, um, come back and take a look at the next video where we'll take uh, finish up their lore and then take an in-depth look at the mechanics between 4th edition and 5th edition. And how did they change? Are they that much different? Um, spoiler alert, they're not that much different. All right, thank you so much. If you like this kind of content, I will be making more, uh, hopefully, uh, rather back-to-back uh, um, -back until the end of the year and into 2024, which is an exciting year for D&D fans because it's the, the 50th anniversary of the game, as I've mentioned a couple times already. So thank you so much for uh, watching. And uh, if you like this uh, video, go ahead and give us a like. Give me a like uh, or and or better, even better yet, subscribe. And I will talk to you guys next time.